headed frogs or kids with leukemia. Nuclear power ain't fit for a dog. The sun don't give us all we need to make this country run. But that nuclear power's got us fussing and fighting. Toledo and good afternoon Columbus and hello to those of you listening on the internet wherever and whenever you are. My name is Joe Damar and I'm here with my erstwhile co-host Rebecca Wood. Yes and together we are about to craft an hour. That that means I used to be your co-host doesn't it? No erstwhile just means you're like really eager and earnest. Okay I'm erstwhile. Yeah erstwhile. (laughs) I'm not sure what adjective you were thinking there but Erstwhile's good. Erstwhile's good, right? <laughs> and together, as you could may have guessed, we're about to craft an amazing hour of radio called For a Green Future. For a Green Future is a program where we talk about ecology and the environment, and we talk about them in the ways that they affect you, your your wealth, your health, your happiness, the health and happiness of your coworkers and your pets and the people who live down the street from you, your neighbors and and the plants and animals and all the fish in Lake Erie and just basically everybody and everything because we're all together on this great planet Earth for which we should be grateful, especially on this, our Thanksgiving episode. Indeedy. Yes, and uh, we've got a great show lined up for you. Uh, first, we're going to talk for a little bit, although we're not going to go all the way till quarter after the way we usually do because uh, we've got so much other content. Uh, then we're going to hear, uh, it's it's a tradition, the three years that we've had this program, each year at Thanksgiving, we've had an interview with uh, Philip Yenyo, who's the director of AIM, American Indian Movement of Ohio, which I have thought is, you know, very appropriate for Thanksgiving, talking with Philip. Uh, then after the interview with Philip, we're going to hear from our fantastic pa- patrons and advertisers. Uh, then Rebecca is going to enlighten us. She's going to tell us a little bit about uh, where? The Where's Kern it? River in Central California. Kern River in Central California. Subtitle, and, Becca Goes Down a Country Music Rabbit Hole. <laughs> <laughs> There's a connection. I'll okay. <laughs> All right. And uh, so then after uh, we hear, hear about the Kern River, we're going to hear uh, ecological news. And, and there's a ton of really big, important ecological things that happened this, this past week that uh, some good, some bad, some uh, ugly. <laughs> Looking forward to it and looking forward to talking with you folks, too, because this is a call-in show. And at any time you'd like, you can call in at 877-909-1007. That's 877-909-1007. And uh, we will read your text eagerly on the air. So, um, particular question, if you want an ecological question, what sort of ecological, ecological thing are you grateful for? At this time of the year, at the Thanksgiving time. Let me start. Oh, go ahead. I I, I feel really grateful this year for the uh, for the largely Native American led movement uh, defending our our water and old growth forests and that kind of thing. You know, they are putting their bodies on the line, and it's it's better than we deserve, but far less than the environment deserves. Yes, we're it, it's inspirational, and we have quite a bit uh, of that to report on in the in the ecological news segment so yes it, we should all be very grateful to, for those people Joe that are, will elaborate yes <laughs> stay tuned <laughs> that are trying to stop pipelines and stop uh, the destruction yeah. of the planet so if you have anything you're grateful for call in 877-909-1007 uh, i want to do i want to just mention an actual little sports thing here uh, as sort of a segue for you folks but uh <laughs> I, I have a nephew who plays high school football, and uh, this is in western New York. And I just wanted to say here, because I believe this audience would appreciate it, that uh, they won their division championship. Uh, they had won their regionals, and then just this past week, they won the division championship. And thanks to my nephew, who was a soccer player for many years, so he's the team's kicker, and he did a, a textbook on site kick. And they had been behind at the half. He did this as they came out of the half, and they recovered it and then went out for a touchdown in four plays and and went on to win the division championship. So two more games. If they win the next two games, they'll actually be the champions of New York State. So uh, 
possibility. So, but I, yeah, I just wanted to brag about that a little What's bit. What's this team called? Uh, the Aggies. Go Aggies. Yeah. It's, it's, uh, <laughs> it's a combination of three rural school districts, none okay. of which were, have enough students to make a football team. Oh, okay. So they lumped them all together and they're, you know, and they've won their division. All right. So, um, yeah, I thought I'd just brag on that a little. And, what is uh, Aggies? Is it uh, <laughs> is something called ag? It starts with ag around there? Uh, you know, I'm not exactly sure what an aggie is. Around here we is. have the, uh, the Agnes Reynolds Jackson uh, uh, Foundation, and then there's... I mean, there were marbles that were called aggies. You know, they're a certain size and shape. Agriculture? Maybe it means agriculture. Ag- I don't know. If somebody Agatha. knows, please, please give us a call. 877 909 I would like to know. Or text us at 419. I'd like to know what words mean. 973 Right. And uh, like I said, I have a short intro this this week, uh, and I did want to just talk a little bit. Uh, this is not quite ecological, but uh, it relates, and that is I just wanted to stress with all the stuff that's been happening in the past couple of weeks, a lot of these court cases and things, I just wanted to stress, you know, I'm, I'm a green, and uh, I've always been a green. I'm neither Republican nor Democrat, and one of the green founding principles is nonviolence. And I just want to say that in the ecological movement, in the environmental movement, nonviolence is an absolutely essential part of what's going on here. Because if right, right now we have protesters that are getting arrested and, and getting brutalized by police sometimes, but if this were a violent movement, you know, if people were bringing guns to these protests and these sit-ins and these blockades, uh, It would be much worse for everyone. And uh, I just want to stress, you know, sometimes it feels frustrating. Sometimes it feels like nonviolence is not going to be a successful tactic. But the problem, but you have to stick with it. we, We cannot descend into violence if we want a green future, because a green future is a peaceful future, a nonviolent future, as well as being an ecologically balanced future. So you're talking about the environmentalist movements, right? Or, uh, yeah. or everything? I, everything. Everything. Yeah, okay. yeah oh, no, I'm, I'm a nonviolence guy across the board. So uh, I just wanted to, since I have a public platform and there's been a lot of public discussion about violence, I just wanted to toss that idea in there. All right. Well, that's all the time I have for, for our pre, our sort of uh, informal chatting part of the show. I think we're going to go ahead and, and uh, Josh, if you could go ahead and play that interview with uh, Philip Yenyo. All right. Uh, Philip Yenyo of American Indian Movement of Ohio. Thanks for coming on again. Uh, this is our third year in a row. Uh, I guess we've actually started a Thanksgiving tradition here. Yeah, it seems. <laughs> yeah. And uh, thank you for having me again. Uh, our, our pleasure. And uh, we're actually, you know, full disclosure, we're recording this the Thursday before Thanksgiving because um, I'm going to be we're going to be on the road on actual Thanksgiving and and uh, of course we have to record the show before we get on on the road so uh, I really appreciate your being flexible here fantastic it's absolutely fine with me okay so uh, this has been quite a year for for a lot of people I mean um, it's almost difficult to to think back and, and think about what you're grateful for <laughs> this year? What what kind of things you're going to be th- giving thanks for this year? Um, I know this has been a, a big year of change for the American Indian Movement of Ohio. You guys had some uh, quite a bit of reorganizing there. Yeah, <laughs> yeah. yeah we we've, we've uh, added a few people to the board, and uh, some other members that had moved out of state have come home and that's that's a good thing um and then you know the the uh the whole thing with the uh name change of the baseball team you know that's uh we had some events that we had planned but uh we had to cancel them (laughs) we wanted to have like a, a big celebration when the name came down off of the uh front of the building and uh, I guess there were some construction delays taking the, the name off. And uh, it was just too close of a time frame 
to get people to come from across the country to uh, celebrate with us. So we're we're looking at some other options uh, that we're going to going to try to explore uh, to celebrate it because it, it is a big deal, um, especially here for our community and not only in Cleveland but you know in the entire state. Because as I've stated before, you. You can't go anywhere in this state without seeing it, you know, without seeing Cleveland Indians name or the uh, their little logo that they used to have. But uh, but there's a lot of things that uh, I am grateful for. Well, yeah, last I, year. I mean, that was uh, that was the culmination of, of many, many years of effort, wasn't it? To to bring down the Cleveland Indians, and, and now they're the, the Cleveland Guardians, right? Yep. Yes, they are. Which is a cool name. <laughs> and actually, you know, the, during the time that this is being recorded, um, tomorrow, um, I think that's Friday the 19th, is when it actually becomes official. Um, oh. Yeah, they're they're changing their, their, uh, their website and everything, so... Wow. So yeah, congratulations. And that Thanks. And that have you been to the field that yet or have you Uh no, I have not. Um and and we've explained to them that we're you know, we're not going to come there until, you know, it's all gone. <laughs> so Right. <clears throat> Right. I know I won't be going in there until it's all gone. So maybe, possibly, you know, sometime next year, I'll I'll take my son and daughter to uh, a baseball game. Um, we'll see where it goes. But I'm I'm really happy that they, uh, you know, they worked with us and and they talked to us and and that's what we we were looking for anyways you know to to sit down and actually speak to them and it went very well. That's great. Yeah, well, maybe you and I can catch a game sometime. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> sounds like season. fun. <laughs> yeah, we'll, we'll head out there. And I, I think it's it's indicative that there there is some movement, you know, something to be grateful for in the, the, the larger North American culture to actually start respecting and, you know, looking at the, the reality of Native American culture in our right. society. So yeah, and, and one of the one of the ways that's manifesting, I guess you'd say, is uh, a little more awareness about what the first Thanksgiving actually was. That uh, the quote unquote first Thanksgiving didn't really go the way the way we were taught as children. Um, there were, I mean, there were there was sub truth to the way it was described, but it was also a lot more complicated than uh, than that. Uh, oh yeah, definitely. And you know, and I, um, I'm still waiting for my my son to bring his social studies uh, book home because I want to see what he's being taught. You know, I've explained to him. You know, these are you know these are um, these stories that they they uh, tell about Columbus and and the first Thanksgiving and and all that are they're sanitized basically i mean you can call it whitewashed it's a, it's the same thing um you know i was watching a news program yesterday and they were talking about critical race theory and they were saying you know these kids that you know parents are worried that their kids are being taught you know and how they're being taught this uh truth in history and and you know, the fact of the matter is critical race theory is not taught in K through 12. It's it's just not. Right. But, uh, some people have this narrative that they want to push and uh, they make people that are gullible believe that it, this is what their children are being taught when it's actually something that's taught in law school. Okay, you, you have to be in college to learn this stuff. That being said, you know, they they believe that all this stuff coming out now uh, with the, the truth being taught is part of critical race theory, and it's really not. Um, you know, the uh, 
the whole premise behind what's going on is to teach kids that you know this is what happened you go into a little bit more depth into what actually happened um and uh, one guy last night on the, the news program said you know people are worried that uh, their kids are being taught especially their caucasian children are being taught that they should hate themselves for uh, you know and that they they're uh um you know that that the past and their ancestors you know that they're paying a price for it no it's, it has nothing to do with that but this is the narrative that's being pushed um right and uh, so when you, when you and this is the whole thing about you know truth and education had these people that are now pushing this narrative been taught the truth to begin with maybe there would be no need for this uh, this theory of critical race theory and 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 all, all these other things because people would be more aware of what is actually uh, going on um, and what actually happened. Um, right. And it's sad because they get they become grown ups and then they <laughs> and it's the same thing with the teachers. <clears throat> They become grown ups and they start teaching this stuff, and they think it's just you know it's kind of they don't realize that they've been lied to or you know they've only heard i can't even you can't even call it half truths maybe one eighth truth you know because mm -hmm. our side of the story was never told right well it's it's a beautiful fantasy the idea that the the pilgrims were just so grateful. That they invited the the Native Americans to come along and, and have a big feast, and and it's kind of what happened, but I, I guess the actual details are a lot more sketchy than that. <laughs> yeah, when you when you get into what what actually happened on that day, you know, the, uh, with the massacre that took place, and then subsequent massacres of villages um, and subsequent days of Thanksgiving after every one of them uh, to the point where they had to say well let's just pick a day well now that that day which you know the true meaning behind what they were giving thanks for has been lost so you have nothing left but this fairy tale that they keep telling yeah let's Let's get specific on it. I mean, the, the first Thanksgiving was pilgrims and natives, but what sparked it apparently was uh, the, the pilgrims were happy to have a good harvest, so they started shooting off their guns, and uh, the, the native tri warriors and the surrounding tribes heard the guns and thought there were there was an attack, so they all showed up with their bows and arrows, and... and uh, the pilgrims were like, "Well, you might, as long as you're here, you might as well stay with us and and have something yeah. to eat." And, and uh, but, but then, the, see, the funny thing that was going on at the same time was the the green corn uh, feast. Uh huh. So that that probably is another reason why the natives, you know, why that nation just stayed and said, you know, well, we'll just have the feast too, you know, at the same time. Right, oh. but then, but then, as you say, the relations—you uh, know—there were actual, uh, there was actually a, a cooperation between the the natives and the pil early pilgrims. But then, that ra that broke down quickly racially, and as you say, the subsequent Thanksgivings were actually celebrations of literally slaughters of Indian villages, and mm -hmm. that's that's a dark stain, but. I think one thing I am grateful for whenever I can get it is is the truth <laughs> because yeah. I, I think you know I feel a lot more gratitude when I actually know the facts than when I have a fantasy no matter no matter how beautiful that that fantasy is I don't try to hold on to it and so yeah go ahead you know I was I was uh, sorry for interrupting I was talking to an elder um, a, a few weeks ago and he was talking about this you know thanksgiving and uh he said you know he said in in our ways this was a, a lakota elder he said you know in our ways um we don't set aside one day because uh, we give thanks every day and, and i thought about that i'm like you know if everybody gave thanks 
every single day of their lives um, for the things that they've been blessed with maybe this wouldn't be such a harsh society that we live in now I mean to constantly be reminded of the gifts that the great spirit has given us and one of those is you know our our physical walk on Unchi Maka, uh, Mother Earth you know every single day we all of us and it doesn't matter what nationality you are um, we all go through our struggles and uh it's how we get through those struggles and how we uh, react to the people around us, you know, um, is, is a form of showing gratitude and being grateful and thankful for the things that you have. Um, I heard a, a, a quote or a phrase of saying, you know, be kind to everyone because you don't know what kind of struggles they're going through. And it's a good uh, ideology to have because we're all going through something. Um, I go through my personal issues. My son goes through his personal issues. His mom, my daughter and her mom, my mom and dad, my brother and sister. And we all have struggles. So mm -hmm. I think uh, the biggest thing for giving thanks for is to be able to get through those struggles um mm -hmm. and having people to get through them with is also something really to be thankful for i think yes the, the idea of feasting and and actually the the natives the, the native americans had a lot of feasts you mentioned the green corn feast but there were there were feasts all through the year weren't there uh, yeah, there were um, for different occasions, different times of year that were uh, considered sacred. Um, they would have different celebrations and people would get together. Um, I'm told of a uh, one ceremony or, or uh, celebration is uh, the potlatch ceremony from the Northwest nations. <laughs> and that is actually around uh, what is known as Christmas time um, where the the chief would get everybody together from the different villages and they'd have a great big celebration and uh, I'm not quite certain which nation it was but people would bring their belongings you know and they would set them out and whatever you needed you took and this way everybody had the same thing there were no squabbles well this person has more that person has more than I, I don't have what they have um so it squashed all kinds of you know like keeping up with the joneses kind of mentality mm -hmm. um mm -hmm. and so i think that's where you know where we get our uh our gift giving um uh-huh type of ceremonies from but and that and that you just a, 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 a no nah, I, I wouldn't take it for fact this is just something i heard so i mean i'm i'm just stating what i've heard um from a different nation I mean, every nation is different you know so they have their own practices and ceremonies right well and you know when you're in that kind of a a giving sort of society you get to be grateful to everybody else too you're not it's not like you're being pitted against them because they're actually giving you stuff <laughs> that you can be grateful for yeah so, yeah so well it, it's been a hard year in a lot of ways for a lot of people but there there are things to be grateful for and uh we had a one thing i'm grateful for we had an amazing garden this year i just couldn't believe it's still putting out Brussels sprouts and carrots and <laughs> cabbage. Wow. Yeah, it's a, it was a great year for the garden. Um, and Me personally, it's been, it's been a really, really rough year. And right now I'm really grateful for the Cleveland Food Bank. Um, ah. it's, I, seriously, it's it's been that bad. Yeah. You know, I, I, I do home remodeling and handyman work. And it is, you know, since the pandemic started, uh, you know, I was doing this kind of work and it seemed to be going well and then it just dropped. So 
I personally have been struggling really bad. I mean, I'm, I'm surprised right now I'm not homeless. Ah. And I that I have, you know, I'm grateful I'm not right now. Well, I'm sorry, sorry to hear that, Philip. And hopefully, when we have uh, the Thanksgiving sh- episode number four, you'll you'll be in a better place uh, materially. Because <laughs> uh, I, I just want to thank you again for taking the time to talk with us. On uh, you know this this is I actually like this holiday better than a lot of the most of the others because it's sort of uniquely American and. And you know the idea of giving thanks. I agree, we should be doing it every single day, but it, at least once a year, everybody sh- is getting together and doing it. So, uh, yeah. So thanks for coming on, Philip. And thank you very much for having me. All right, hold on here, let and, me. Uh, okay. You know my my best uh, blessings and wishes for everybody listening. Uh, thanks. Okay. So that was our Thanksgiving interview with Philip Yenyo of the American Indian Movement of Ohio. Uh, now it's time for something that we're also thankful for, and that is our advertisers and patrons. We're very thankful for them because we literally couldn't be bringing you this show without them. And uh, consider joining them. <laughs> if you've got a business, consider becoming an advertiser. If you you know can spare a couple bucks a month, consider becoming a patron. Anyway, our... Uh, show is brought to you by the Wood County Park District. The Wood County Park District is a natural resources conservation agency. They protect natural spaces, maintain quality green spaces, provide engaging programming, and they teach people to love and respect nature. They restore wildlife habitats, and they lead outdoor adventures. Wood County Parks protects natural spaces in Wood County for all to enjoy from 8 a.m. to 30 minutes past sunset every single day of the year which means today you can get out and go to any of the Wood County Parks today. There's several ways to get a hold of them to find out what's going on there. One is uh, calling 419-353-1897. That's 419-353-1897. Another is to go to their website, which is wcparks.org. You can also go to any app store and search for their nifty app. Just search for WC Parks. And uh, they have an announcement, uh, put out a press release. They just uh, picked a new director for the Wood County Parks. And uh, you folks in Toledo should know that uh, he was the just for, the former director of the uh, Toledo Metro Parks. So those are some really nice parks, too. So hopefully uh, we'll be seeing some great things coming at the Wood County Park District. Four Green Futures also brought to you by our patrons, and these are wonderful people who've gone to patreon.com, that's P-A-T-R-E-O-N, and they searched for Four Green Future, and lo and behold, up popped our Patreon, Patreon page, and I'm hoping I'm not popping too many of my peas here into the microphone, <laughs> uh, but uh, there's uh, different levels of membership, and people just choose the membership level that they can afford that's not painful for them. Because as we often say, the green future is not a painful future. You're going to be richer, not poorer, if we have a, a green future. And a uh, little bit comes out of their checking account every month, comes over to us, and that's how we can uh, afford to bring this, keep the show on the air. So that's patreon.com. Okay, now, Rebecca, it's time to bring us sort of back to our ecological focus and uh, you have some interesting stories about California. I do, yeah. So I, I am about to expose myself to serious derision here by outing myself as a fan of Dwight Yoakam. <laughs> Dwight Yoakam. Dwight Yoakam. Uh, Fast as You. Fast as You is totally my, my karaoke jam. Oh, okay. All right. I'm that Dwight. I'm pretty good at it. And if you ever seen that video, I don't believe that man's pelvis is actually connected to his backbone in any way. <laughs> he does stuff which would embarrass uh, both Elvis and Cardi B. Wow. Okay. <laughs> so, yeah. And you know, he has a song about Bakersfield that he sings with. Uh, oh, I've forgotten the name. Oh. Buck Owens, yeah. He's singing okay. a song about Bakersfield, California, because he considered that to be like this mecca of authentic country music, because I guess some singers from the 70s were there or something, so he... 
it, that was like his model instead of Nashville, you know, it was just sort of less commercialized era of country music. So yeah, I looked up Bakersfield, uh, it just because I'm a weirdo, and um, there's something called the Kern River that runs through it. Uh, it's 165 miles long, basically uh, in the San Joaquin Valley, Central California, a little bit west of West uh, Death Valley, so you could go there, you know, if you, if you want to see the Sierra Madres Death Valley and, and uh, the, the Kern River, you could kind of swing by, you know. Uh, also the subject of, I did not know this, a Merle Haggard song. It's a, the fact it's a, it's a title of his, uh, of his, the song and his, an entire Merle Haggard album, which has lines like, not deep or wide, but a mean piece of water, which, um, it's true. It's not deep or wide. It's not all that long, but, uh, oh gosh, I think it was 195 people have died in the Kern River in 30 years, including apparently Merle Haggard's girlfriend. Oh, no. <laughs> yeah, it's it has the nickname Killer Kern. Huh. Uh, the, the authorities uh, recommend that you really just do not go in it. Do not go in it at all. Don't even dip your toe in. <laughs> um, huh. there, if you do, if you really have to, it's not illegal, but if you really have to, you better wear a life preserver and preferably take a guide. Get to know the river, you know, over time. Do not just dive in somewhere and be like, yay, I'm going to freestyle crawl across this thing. No, no, no. Bad idea. Hmm. So, yeah, um, it's a source of several small lakes near the base of Mount Whitney, which he also mentioned or the source is sorry the source of the Kern River he mentions this in the song he mentions Mount Whitney he mentions Mount Shasta which is where he moved out because he was so devastated he sort of drifted upward because he was so devastated about the uh, the death of his childhood and childhood sweetheart there and uh, see Mount Whitney is the highest mountain in the Sierra Nav uh, Nevadas and the contiguous United States the lower 48 basically he also says I grew up in an oil field uh, but my gusher never came in uh, probably referring to there's two or three around there probably referring to the Kern River oil field which is northeast of Bakersfield in the uh, Bakersfield in the Sierra Fit foothills and the fifth largest oil oil field in the United States so yeah who basically used to oh other, other interesting about thing about this river um, it just kind of stops at a certain point, which is curious when you look at the map. It's this, you know, big scary river starts up in the mountains, then it disappears before it gets anywhere near any lakes or oceans. That's because of something called the Isabella Dam. <laughs> Partly. Okay. Um, yeah, and also in the, the, in, until the 1800s, uh, the biggest freshwater, it was, it was actually the San Juan Quid Valley had the biggest freshwater wetland complex in the western United States. Uh, it had three lake beds, the, the Tulare Lake Bed, Buena Vista Lake Bed, and the Kerr Lake Bed. Uh, were the three main basins southwest of Bakersfield. Um, apparently, it's all just been basically diverted for agriculture. The Isabella Dam ended the, was built to end floods in the mid 1900s. Although I think they were more kind of mostly seepy floods, you know, mm -hmm. <laughs> just some mm -hmm. farmland got flooded, so they wanted to dry it up. Um, today, they ran a highway through the mid middle of uh, Kern Lake, but today it's sort of a lake sometimes or sort of a swampy lake because there are a lot of cracks in the levee which they're just kind of not bothering to fix and also like they when there's excessive water you know they let some seep into the lake bed so the wetland kind of comes back a little it's, it's apparently a pretty good, good place for birds and fish and things um yeah they created the lake isabella reservoir instead of the three lake basins uh, and the it's a sub entirely submerging the town of Kernville and relocating it. <laughs> so, but it, previously uh, the area was uh, this is Native American Heritage Month still. Uh, it was, or just because it's a good idea to mention this, it was uh, it was occupied by the Yokut people. There was a large village apparently on the current. Uh, Coles Levy Ecosystem Preserve, and the lakeshore has been, apparently been inhabited since 6500 BC at least. Uh, they're, the Yokuts are formerly known as the Mariposa people. Oh, uh huh. But they're actually, there were 60 tribes under that heading pre contact and several related languages in Central California. Uh, there are about 6,273 Yokuts left. People defined as Yokuts. Uh, they practice Christianity, the Kuksu religion, and formerly the ghost dance, which is petered out a bit because they kept shooting them. <laughs> um, so that was 
bad. Apparently, some people represent the word uh, resent the the uh, the word yokut because it's an exonym that was that was forced on them by outsiders, and they prefer their individual tribal subgroup name. Which apparently, as far as I can tell, is the Foothill Yokuts, the North Valley Yokuts, and the Southern Valley Yokuts. Or if there's a better name that you can call the people formerly known as Yokuts, go ahead and let us know. Um, interestingly, they're responsible for something called the Painted Rock Rock Art, or at least part of it. Uh, Painted Rock is a sandstone formation near the uh, Soda Lake in Canizo Plain, in the, it, it, which is yeah the Canizo Plain National Monument area north of Bakersfield. Um, also, the, the Chumash and Sa Salinan peoples, Salinas peoples uh, created it also, but the ones they they believe, there's some controversy about who all contributed to that, but they believe that the Yokuts tribe is responsible for the most large and colorful figures and motifs uh, on the rock. So that is something to see also if you're in the area checking out uh, Death Valley and other stuff. All right, cool. So, an important little river down there that, uh, yeah. of course, engineers got to look at it and said, oh, we got to put a dam up on that. Right, <laughs> yeah. This, this, uh, engineers always got to improve stuff. But, you know, one there is a saying among engineers, though, that all dams are temporary because eventually, you know, the water will win and it sounds like the water is uh, scoring some points there right right now yeah so. you know it may be partly you know it's probably a combination of you know budgetary problems and the environment that it's actually sort of good for the environment if you let it leak some so mm -hmm. you know and okay. there's there's a movement to uh just get rid of the dam and, and uh bring back the the base the lake basins ah that sounds good yeah. you're here all right well thanks rebecca and uh remember you can comment on anything you've heard on the show at any time 419 973-5841 for texting or 877-909-1007 for calling. Okay, so now on to ecological news. And there's a ton of it. And how many minutes have we got here? I think we've got enough. Uh, first story, first dramatic story is British Columbia. Yes, the, the place where we've been talking a lot about British Columbia because, of course, that's where the Ferry Creek encampment is where they're trying to save old growth forest up there uh they just got hit by incredible incredible amounts of rain you. uh which have resulted in landslides oh boy uh in fact the landslides are so severe that 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 victoria the capital city of uh british columbia is completely cut off uh -oh. <laughs> all roads and bridges into victoria have been destroyed and uh they're they're working on getting them back but uh this is an important ecological story for a couple reasons one of course is that this is uh, very clearly a global warming enhanced weather event is there any chance that's going to help us by by letting the logging trucks not go through uh it has slowed the logging it has definitely slowed the logging so yeah there's a little bit of a delay there uh but the other reason that this is an important uh, ecological story is that where these landslides are happening is where there was clear-cut logging and this is oh is that not a coincidence joe <laughs> <laughs> this is a not coincidence this is not a coincidence because wherever well, almost whenever you, you hear about some horrible landslide like down in central america or wherever where lots of property gets destroyed people get buried in mud because tree roots are the rebar of soil exactly <laughs> oh very nice i like that yeah uh tree uh, the tree roots and the fungus that live and feed right. with the tree roots right. and both of those start dying as soon as you cut down the trees Ew. and so typically it takes about two years after a big clear cut on a hillside and uh, then you get this massive uh this massive landslide and the cost of that is never calculated when they talk about the quote-unquote value of logging because this economic is, impact yeah because this is going to cost literally billions of dollars to try to from scratch rebuild bridges and roads into victoria and the company is not going to pay for that no the logging company that that created the situation that led to the landslide they're, they're not on the hook for that uh, even though they caused it, literally caused it. And there's actually, in Victoria right now, they are having shortages because the trucks can't get in to bring them supplies. And so food is running low and 
And uh, if you need some kind of medicine urgently and you don't have a supply, you might be in trouble. And uh, houses have been destroyed. Many, many houses have been destroyed. And uh, there are fatalities, although the numbers are still coming in on how many people were actually killed. But uh, it's just another example. And it just, again, points up how clearly the people at Ferry Creek are actually um, trying to protect the people of British Columbia as they're protecting the old growth forest. It's not like you get your it's not like you're sacrificing the forest for the benefit of the people. You're actually sacrificing the forest to the harm of people. People want to pretend it's trees against people. Who's gonna win? You know, but no, that's not how it works. No, the trees are on our side. It's like, you know, cutting down it's like taking out your own ally. Uh, it's like to use a, a sports analogy, it's like you're the it's like you're a quarterback who who decides to like clip you know take out half your offensive line <laughs> from behind you know but <laughs> right. they've got their backs to you so it's like you kick them and then you make the, <laughs> then you try to make a play it's like no no it doesn't work uh and along that line also the uh, the wetsuwet'en who are also up there in canada are trying to stop a pipeline and we've had uh, people on from the wetsuwet'en protests before uh in 2019, it was a very dramatic situation because protests against that pipeline on the, through their unceded territories uh, s stopped rail traffic all over Canada. They've reinstated their blockades because the, the pipeline people said, you know what, the attention's elsewhere, let's start making this pipeline again. Uh, the police just went in, weaponized police carrying submachine guns and things like that, arrested 15 peaceful Wet'suwet'en protesters. Uh, actually, it was uh, wet sweating, and it was uh, protesters from a number of other tribes, as well as just regular old Canadian folk. Uh, they arrested 15 people, even as, and they were doing this even as other parts of British Columbia were crumbling into flash floods and and mudslides. They had the they had their police up there trying to arrest people, just trying to stop a pipeline. Kind of crazy. So, uh, just letting people know that's going on. Next story, and uh, we're, we're, it looks like we are probably going to be able to get through them. So, this is Joe DeMar breaking into the recorded broadcast that had aired live in Toledo. And uh, I had reported during this little segment a story about people in, in Denmark suing the Danish government over climate change. I cannot find that story again, and I can't find any corroboration of it so it looks like that story might have just been something somebody floated on the internet that was probably not true uh, what I did find is that the Danish government in 2019 uh, committed to hard deadlines of getting cutting carbon by 70% by 2030 which is great but uh, and I did also find that there was a story that some Dutch people had sued the government of the Netherlands over global warming way back in uh, I believe it was 2015 and at that time the uh, judge set a hard deadline for uh, cutting carbon by 2020 uh, 25 percent uh, but the thing is that the story that I reported initially live on the air I cannot now find any corroboration for so I had to cut it out and talk to you folks uh, directly instead so I hope you enjoy the rest of the show this is Joe DeMar signing off. And, and I'm going to follow that with some even more good news. So two good news, good feel-good stories in a row. Uh, in the last year of the Trump administration, some of you may recall that we reported that uh, President Trump had gutted the Migratory Bird Act. And this was a treaty that we had with Canada. Basically, it says if you kill migratory birds, you're liable for it. Uh, you, you have to pay a penalty and so a lot of companies change their practices to avoid those penalties because it the penalties were like per bird so like you kill you know cool a canada <laughs> goose you get fined this much you kill a thousand canada geese you get fined a thousand times more um and so what trump did in his uh, evilness was he said that the only way this applies is if a company kills an animal on a migratory bird on purpose in other words, they have to have in hand the memo 
where the CEO of the company says, hey, let's go kill some birds, guys. You have to actually hire someone on the phone to, uh, here's, here's, a, here's a million bucks, take out that goose. Right, exactly. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> and needless to say, that meant, you know, no enforcement at all because, you know, who goes out and purposely kills birds or leaves a paper trail if they're going to do it. Right. So, uh, so uh, the U.S. Fish and Wildlife Service has reversed that policy. And so oh, now, heavens. according to the Audubon Society, we're back to the old uh, situation. And in fact, the Fish and Wildlife Service is thinking of putting in regulations that would make it even stronger. Good. Because uh, one of the biggest killers of birds right now and this is far greater than the number that are killed by uh, wind turbines for example uh, is uh, oil lakes Ew. yeah if you are involved in oil drilling oftentimes there'll be spills and uh, adjacent to your to your derricks or whatever there'll be this like pond of oil uh, an open f- pond of oil just sitting there just sitting there and to birds it looks like water and unfortunately for the birds the physics of oil uh since it's not as dense as water if you land on it and you're a bird instead of floating you sink Uh you go right to the bottom and and so that kills literally millions and millions of birds every year so there's like dead bird soup yes at the bottom of every every bottom one of those every oil ponds you'll find you know thousands of dead birds uh, so they're, the Fish and Wildlife Service is actually considering requiring things like uh, covering those, those right. oil ponds. That sounds put, like a good idea. Putting a, like a lid or a cover on them so the birds can't get in there to die. Right, right. And uh, so uh, this was brought to me my attention by the Audubon Society. And there's an open uh, comment period going until December 3rd. So if you think it's a good idea to not kill millions of birds every year, <laughs> uh, it's a good time to... Go to the Audubon Society, find their action page, and uh, and uh, make a comment to the U.S. Wildlife Fish and Wildlife Service. Next story, because it can't be all good news, unfortunately. This is a story from uh, Manga Bay, and it was uh, November eighth, twenty twenty one, by a reporter named Liz Kimbrough. And it Where's tur- Manga Bay. Uh, Manga Bay is the name of the this uh, online paper. It's oh. not, I don't think it's a place. Okay. Never Could be mind. a place, but I don't believe so. There's probably B-E on the end. Manga Bay. Anyway, <laughs> in the Build Back Better, I ha- and I have to say this, they, they are using a strategy, the same strategy they used in the uh, Obamacare, which is a strategy I call the four good things. And which is whenever they talk about it, they mention the four good things that nobody's going to argue with that the bill does uh like uh, electric car chargers and and uh, money for wind turbines and solar power um you know all those good things but these are huge bills with trillions of dollars and so there's actually thousands of things in these bills and what manga bay has uncovered is that uh there's big sections in there that encourage uh logging of Old growth forests, which is nah, which we know is is dumb. Um, also, they have uh, they're supporting fossil fuel and fossil fuel infrastructure on public lands, oh, great. which is another bad idea. And probably the 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 worst idea, the the, the most egregious mm-hmm. thing in there, ecologically speaking, is encouraging the use of forests for biomass. That is, you cut down a forest, you turn it into little pellets, and then you use those little pellets to burn and generate electricity. Okay, but is it still just useful as a forest? (laughs) Yes. (laughs) That's right. If you're trying to actually stop carbon dioxide, you don't burn a forest and put all that carbon in the air, and you don't clear-cut the forest in the first place because that, as we know... Will, will that for that dead forest will release carbon for the next 20 years until the new forest can get big enough that it, it actually captures more carbon than it releases oh, great. and uh so there's actually been a uh, hundred scientists have actually issued an open letter to president joe biden uh telling him to take out the the logging forest biomass and fossil fuel provisions and of course as we also know the uh there's tons of money in there for nuclear power too 
And so the whole Build Back Better is starting to sound like uh, Build Back Browner when you, no, when you get into the geez. details. I mean... That's not better. That's not what was that's no. not in the definition of better. But that's that's the <laughs> kind of worse. That's how this four good things strategy works. Yeah. Is, is most news stories aren't going to even mention things like cutting down forests for biomass. And that's the meme that gets distributed. Oh, he did these, or you know, the headline, right? As the case might be. Look at this, this, you know, these trillion dollar bills. We we're doing four good things with them. Yeah. But you're also, but you can't at the same time do twenty bad things. Yeah. It doesn't add up it doesn't it doesn't work out um speaking of something else that doesn't work out or add up our next story we go back to the pl- tr- problem plagued vogel nuclear plants over there in georgia mm. and they've just been hit with another problem and that what, georgia united states or georgia georgia united states georgia, okay. they're, they're the only nuclear plants under construction in the u.s and they're 10 years behind schedule and uh, 14 billion dollars over budget uh, and they just, it turns out, they just did the NRC, which is, you know, the, usually kind of a toothless um, organization, has actually slapped a fine on them, or has actually slapped them down. And Because what they did is they took their cables, their power cables from the control cables. And nuclear power plants are required to have uh, backup power, you know, backup control systems in right. case the main control system fails. Right. Pretty smart. Yeah. Unfortunately, they put the cables for both the backup and the primary system through the same conduits. Okay, so if they go down, they all go down together. Right. Okay. Exactly. <laughs> I'm not smart about engineering stuff, and yet that jumped out at me. Yes, that's exactly right. And that's actually, uh, there's a famous nuclear near miss, uh, near meltdown at Browns Ferry nuclear oh power plant boy. where exactly that happened. They had a. Uh, a fellow who was checking insulation with a candle to see if there were air leaks and the candle set fire to both the primary controls and the backup controls and they came within like a first of all should, should they be so you should use a flashlight <laughs> well no that he was checking okay. air currents oh, you have okay. a candle and see which way the flame flickers and that I tells see. you if there's an air leak which air leaks are important i don't think they should be so vulnerable plants. that they could be set on fire with a candle <laughs> well that's another a whole other point also but about half uh u.s nuclear plants have this basic design flaw uh the other half don't but but the, the ones that were do have it we're allowed to grandfather it in because it's so expensive to try to fix but a brand new plant should have been built without this design flaw and instead they instead they built these brand new plants using this mistake from the 1950s and so now it looks like they're going to have to start all over again on the electrical wiring which means they'll be even more they, billions they, behind they, they and more stop, decades. Maybe, maybe just they stop. could just stop. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> Please no, just that's, stop. No, that's that's happened before. They have tossed good money after bad to the point. And some nuke plants have been abandoned when they were ninety nine percent completed. So fingers are crossed. Vocal will yeah, follow that pattern. Uh, but there is thirty five billion dollars for new nukes in the Build Back Better Browner bill, and so uh, we could check that with. Uh, uh, NEARS, our friends at NEARS are, are fighting that, so go to Nuclear Information Resource, Resource Service to check on that. Alright, and just one more story. So we made it through all the stories. I had eight of them today. Uh, this is good news. Uh, the Power Sighting Board, Ohio Power Sighting Board, has approved a solar installation in uh, Weston, Ohio. So that's near Bowling Green. Yay! 101 megawatts, 585 acres, um, it means four hundred and twenty-five thousand dollars a year for the local schools, and uh, rooftop solar is preferable, in my opinion, to these huge solar fields because you get forty percent of our power that way. But the solar fields are not bad. The roofs are already there, you know. Yeah. You don't got to knock anything down to build them. Right, and it's important to note that you can continue to farm underneath solar farms. You can grow vegetables. Cool. You know, they don't block so much light that nothing will grow under them. Right. You can have, you know, so it can be both a solar farm and kind a regular like farm. how you have a roof, but your house plants can still grow sometimes. Yeah, exactly. Right. So uh, that's good news. It looks like getting rid of uh, the first energy thug, Sam Randazzo means the power siding board's actually working. Uh, of course, now with House Bill 192, this was grandfathered in before that law. Now that that law's in place, that this might not have happened, might not be able to happen in the future. So, But let's celebrate the win we got there in Weston. Yay. All right, that's it for this week. Thanks so much. This is Joe Damar. And Rebecca Wood. Saying thank you and signing off. Bye-bye. Your power.